We thank you, gracious God, that when we turn away from you, you don't turn away from us, but that you judge us in order to bring us back to yourself. We pray that as we study the prophet Jeremiah, we may hear your word of judgment to us and to your people and your call to return to you. We ask for your blessing upon us now after the holiday break. Uh, guide us, teach us, inspire us, help us to complete the work that still needs to be done before the end of the trimester. We commend ourselves, this whole community, and particularly Greg and Peter Lockwood as they uh, celebrate the life of their uncle and participate in his funeral today. In Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Jeremiah, the prophet of repentance. Now, for us, repentance quite often has the idea of feeling sorry. But repentance in the Old Testament is something far more simple. It means turning back to God. Sin is turning your back on God, walking out on Him. Repentance is returning to God. Now, in Jeremiah's day, things had become uh, so bad in the persistent, not only apostasy of the people, the people that they worship the right God in the wrong way, but also worship Baals and other gods, um, that God uh, uh, decided to bring judgment on them. It wasn't so much just because of their sin, remember, but because of their lack of repentance. Again and again, God sent prophets. The last of them, the great prophet Jeremiah, to call them back to themselves, they refused. They persisted in their sin and in their unbelief. And so God had no option but to use what C.S. Lewis calls the megaphone. Um, and he put it quite perceptively, he says, when we turn away from God, God first of all uses the gentle whisper in our conscience. If we don't listen to the whisper in our conscience, he gets somebody to tell us off. It doesn't come from inside, but it's somebody outside of us, usually somebody close to us. If we don't listen to the voice of God's messenger, and the most clear of that is when somebody who clearly represents him, like a pastor or parent, calls us to repentance, if we don't use, uh, listen to his telling off, then he uses his megaphone. He gives, and his megaphone is events. He lets us suffer the consequences of our action. He doesn't give us the chop because then that would be the end of us. He gives, the, yes, he uses his stick, if you like, his rod. Um, now, um, uh, one of, uh, we had a look at some themes of Jeremiah, if I can just repeat what we did uh, last period uh, about the main themes of Jeremiah. Jeremiah's authority as a prophet, his announcement of God's judgment on Judah and Jerusalem because of their disobedience in breaking God's covenant, breaking the first commandment. Um, the need for repentance and uh, uh, the refusal of Judah and the people to repent. Um, list, uh, uh, not listen to God. The failure of the prophets, priests and kings to correct Israel's wrongdoing. Um, in fact, they confirmed Israel in their wrongdoing, excused their sin. And then, last of all, we ended, I think, before the holiday on, in, with Jeremiah's very famous temple sermon. Remember, he st stood at the gate from the outer sanctuary to the inner sanctuary and uh, 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 called the people to repentance and announced the destruction of the temple in Jerusalem. Now, um, now comes a rather surprising theme. Um, if people sin, and if the leaders of the nation were the ones who were most persistent in, in sinning and encouraging people to continue to sin, in excusing sin, who would you have expected to come 
under God's judgment and to suffer. The leaders. The leaders. Do you know who it is who suffers most? Jeremiah. Jeremiah. And this is one of the strange features of the book of Jeremiah. You have the so-called sufferings of Jeremiah and his laments because he suffers. Now, on the face of it, he suffers because he speaks the word of God. He suffers because he speaks the word of God. People mock him, reject him, turn on him. And um, it's several times he nearly loses his life because he spoke the word of God. Yes, uh, Tony? Yeah, I was going to say, does, is, translating that to this life, Yes. if we speak the truth and somebody doesn't want to listen to the truth, they, they reject it. They, it's not always the case, but very often it's the case. Yeah. Um, yeah. Sometimes people remarkably listen, but particularly when it comes to a call to repentance, people don't listen. If you preach prosperity, people will listen. Mm -hmm. yeah. But if you um, expose sin and call to repentance, most people will not enjoy what you say. Nobody likes, yeah. nobody likes hearing their thoughts. Yes, and hearing the truth. No, I don't. I'm, I don't know about you. Now, let's have a look at one of the laments of Jeremiah. Um, can we start... Uh, Steve, with you, uh, in uh, chapter 4, 19 through to 22. Chapter 4. This is just typical of quite a number of the laments of Jeremiah. And there's something funny, unusual, odd, that you'll notice as we go. Chapter 4. Uh, uh, just read the preceding verse as a lead-in, verse 18, just by itself. Your own conduct and actions have brought this upon you. This is your punishment. How bitter it is, how it pierces to the heart. Okay, now notice there, the, he's talking to the people, their own conduct have brought the events, the judgments of God on them, and it pierces the heart. The question is, whose heart does it pierce? Have a look. Now, okay, okay, keep going. Oh, my anguish, my anguish, I writhe in pain. Oh, the agony of my heart, my heart pounds within me. I cannot keep silent. Just stop there. Who's speaking here? I'm not real sure. Oh, so Jeremiah. Jeremiah is speaking here. And the language he's using here is the language of a heart attack. Jeremiah is speaking as if he is experiencing a heart attack. No, um, it touches his heart, he writhes, he feels terrible pain. But then things get a little bit strange. Why is he experiencing a heart attack? Um, what's going on here? Read, go on reading. For I have heard the sound of the trumpet. I have heard the battle cry. Disaster follows disaster. The whole land lies in ruins. I do just stop there. Um, what, what has brought on this attack on his heart is the news of an invasion. The battle cry, and the, there's armies that are invading the land and coming down to Jerusalem, which is the heart of the land. Keep going. How long? Oh, in an instant my tents are destroyed, my shelter in a moment. How long must I see the battle standard and hear the sound of the trumpet? Just stop there. Um, my tents are destroyed, my shelter, in a moment. Now, this is no longer Jeremiah speaking. Here, it's, it's Israel, or particularly the city of Jerusalem. If you get this kind of language, you, it's Mother Zion here um, that's speaking. So the people, but particularly Zion, Jerusalem, her tents are the villages around the uh, Jerusalem. Uh, the shelter is the protection of the city. Um, the word that's used here, shelter, is you know, the fortifications. 
not the walls around Jerusalem, but you get fortresses on the approaches to Jerusalem um, are being what? They're being destroyed in a moment. How long must I see the battle standard and hear the sound of the trumpet? So um, you get, first of all, Jeremiah seems to be speaking, and then Zion seems to be speaking. And now what happens? Keep going. My people are fools. They do not know me. They are senseless children. They have no understanding. They are skilled in doing evil. They know not how to do good. Who's speaking here? God. God. So you get an army attacking the heart. It attacks the heart of Jeremiah. In what sense? He has a heart attack. Now, uh, but he himself is experiencing what Jerusalem has experienced because there's an attack on the heart of the nation. Zion or Israel? One of these two is here. So is three, just hold on. Just Sorry. hold on. Yeah. I just want to follow through. Yeah. So there's an attack on Jeremiah, but he is experiencing in himself what the nation is experiencing, what the city is experiencing. And uh, what he and the city is experiencing is what God is experiencing. The invasion is attack on the heart of God. Now the heart of God is located where? Well, we can say Jerusalem. It is in Jerusalem. Where in Jerusalem? In the temple. Je in the temple. Remember God had said that in the temple he would play his, his eyes and his ears and his heart. So, um, uh, Jeremiah experiences the suffering of the people but, so, and God's judgment on the people, but God's judgment on the people is God's judgment on himself. Can you see that? So he shares in the sufferings of the people, but he also shares in the sufferings of God. Now, there's something strange going on here. Can you see? You have a God who suffers... And the judgment that he brings on his people are something that uh, affects him and affects his heart and brings about his own suffering. Any questions on that? Tony had some... I just saw it threefold, physically, spiritually. Yeah, right through. That's all. Well, it's much more concrete than yeah. that. Yes, you yes, could... Yes. What's the physical? Yeah. Uh, this is the war here. Okay, what's the psychological? Is this? And this is, if you call it, the theological dimension. But um, I, I don't think that's all that helpful because they're all so closely interconnected mm. here. Um, now, here once again, you get a theme that you'll f we will be touching on again when we come to the prophet uh, Hosea. It's the theme of the suffering of God. We've come across it in Exodus, remember? God suffers with his people and therefore he redeems his people. Um, here again you see God suffering with his people. Next theme, um, Jeremiah doesn't only prophesy God's judgment on Israel and the end of the city of Jerusalem, the end of the temple, but he prophesies that after 70 years there will be a return from exile. Garth, can you go to this very famous passage, um, Jeremiah 29, 10 to 14. Jeremiah 29, 10 to 14. Garth, read please. This is what the Lord says. When so many years are completed for Babylon, I will come to you and fulfill my gracious promise to bring you back to this place. For I know the plans I have for you, declares the Lord. Plans to prosper you and not to harm you. Plans to give you a hope and a future. Then you will call upon me and come and pray to me, and I will listen to you. You will seek me and find me when you seek me with all your heart. Is it two fourteen or yes? Yeah. I will be found by you, declares the Lord, and I will bring you back from captivity. I will gather you from all the nations and place where I have abandoned, where I have banished you, declares the Lord, and bring and bring you back. To the place from which I carried you into exile. 
So God's judgment on Jerusalem and the, as a city would last 70 years. 70 years from between the destruction of the temple, roughly speaking, to the 70 years of the rededication of the temple, the restoration of the city. Yes, um, Dylan? I notice a lot that that verse is used in a personal sense nowadays. Is that actually applicable? I not mean, really. Not really. No, because it ha well, it, you could say it has to. You can apply it to the restoration of uh, the church okay, or the so people of God, um, but only fairly. Yeah, uh, I'll be wary of, of doing it too quickly. The return from exile, but not making anything of the seventy years. The seventy years is very specific here. Oh, I just meant mainly the I have plans for you to prosper you. To prosper you and not to harm you. Uh, that plan to give you hope and a yeah, um, like yes, that can apply. That's generally provided that you don't see the word that goes before it. Um, not just here, but generally in Jeremiah. Which people does God plan to prosper? Israel. Which, not all the Israelites. Those who believe. Um, not even that. The ones who were taken away as exile. The ones that were taken away yeah. in exile and the ones who did what when they were in exile? Look who back. repented so this is a promise not generally not a general promise it's a promise to God's people the church if you like that okay. repents okay. the promise of God judges always in order to save um, yes uh, he doesn't take any delight in destroying now what we're having is a, everywhere in the church is a truncated theology and one you know, uh, half theology. It's not the full theology of the Council of God. And one of the worst of these is, is prosperity teaching. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And this is one of the... It's huge. Um, uh, because people want to hear it. Yeah. The one thing that particularly yuppies <laughs> and uh, baby boomers don't want to hear is God's judgment on sin, and particularly God's judgment on sexual sin. Um, start talking about that and you'll get very, very unpopular. I don't Actually, I, I disagree. Uh, Some of the biggest pastors in America preach law and gospel, proper law and gospel, and their churches flourish. Okay, yes, yeah. uh, because, but that's uh, uh, because nobody else is doing it. Yeah, yeah. Um, <laughs> and you get people then with good conscience then who are coming uh, because they're not hearing what they should be hearing in their own churches. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, uh, but, uh, yeah, but if you take it as a whole, mm. definitely not the case. So, we, as Lutherans, we're doing that as well? I can't judge yeah. what's had generally. I don't know what's happening in every par parish in the LCA. Um, I suspect that uh, you're getting both things happening. You get a pastors who are very f faithful, but they're not the ones that are popular, and they're not the ones that, whose names get written up in the Lutheran. Uh, <laughs> Berto? The faithful ones and the best things are happening in little country congregations and in places where um, very often people think nothing's happening there. These congregations are dead. The most lively congregations are the ones that, from a worldly point of view, very often seem to be most dead. Um, shrinking congregations in the country because there's no people left there anymore. And yet that's where the most remarkable things are happening, as far as I know. But look, I can't judge yeah. uh, that. All I know is what I've heard and what I experience. And um, uh, what I want to do is to make sure that you, each one of you, is going to be faithful in your ministry and that you preach both law and gospel. And you preach law correctly. Not as a means of salvation, but you preach what in Lutheran terms is the three uses of the law. Uh, which you need to get your head around very, very clearly. Um, but you always, always preach law and you distinguish law and gospel. The law never saves anybody. How do you, how do you, what are the three things of law? The three uses of the law. Uh, the first one is the so-called political use of the law, which is the, uh, the way God's law works in the order of creation. Why is it that the sun rises every morning? Why is it that we have rain? Why is it that human beings reproduce, that there's life on earth? It's because of God's law that's at work everywhere in the world. Whether people believe or don't believe, and everywhere in the world, if people observe God's law, 
If people are faithful in marriage, let's say, there's blessings that come upon them, whether they're believers or unbelievers. doesn't matter. Okay? That's the first use of the law, applying to all human beings in the order of creation. The second use of the law is the so-called theological use. It's the uh, Ten Commandments and the way the Ten Commandments are used to diagnose sin, expose sin, and bring people to repentance. That, if you like, is the uh, uh, so-called theological use, the diagnostic use of the law. And then there's the third use of the law, um, which uh, shows us uh, what God's will is and the works that are pleasing to God. Now, we need to distinguish between um, uh, justification of the person. We have justification by grace through faith. The gospel saves. Good works don't save. But people who are saved are called to do what? Do good works. And if you do good works, God is pleased with you. If you're a good student, God is pleased with you. If you're a good husband or a wife or son, God is pleased with you. If you keep the Ten Commandments, God is pleased with you. Um, these are the God-pleasing works. It's very simple. Oh, it, it helps to understand so much. And that's the way, in case you've... I don't know how much teaching you've had on Luther's small catechism, or if it's large catechism, that's the way Luther uses the Ten Commandments, in those three ways. Well, that's, that's the fourth commandment. On your father and your mother, and what? That it may go well with you and you'll live long in the land. Uh, if you keep the commandments, there are blessings for you in the order of creation. And God is pleased with you. You do the will of God. It's not God's will that you should sin. Uh, but that's sometimes the message that people almost seem to get. Uh, better, yes, quickly. Uh, <laughs> uh, look, I'm sorry. Uh, it's, this is all very, very important. And uh, uh, it, when we, we cover something, it'll have to be at the expense of something else. So let's make it efficient. Is there a confusion with the word pros prosperity? Particularly here, they will prosper. Yes, yeah. Because it's, one not it's not material. It can have material, be, but yeah. basically it's not material. True prosperity is... It's in heart. Yeah, and uh, say now which who which which um, uh, couple prospers? Um, a couple that uh, 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 has a good marriage, has children that are uh, uh, God fearing, that get married and have grandchildren, and that do the right thing. Um, now, um, none of them may be lawyers and doctors and big shots. Uh, the couple has enough to live by, but they're not wealthy, they're generous, and they live a, uh, uh, an ordinary life. You get uh, family number two, um, they've got tons of money. Husband and wife are working. There's strains in the marriage because they're both working. Um, they can take big expensive holidays, they can go out to dinner five or six times a week, their kids have gone to the best schools, they've got the best jobs, um, so on. From one point of view you can say which of these two families is prospering? Well, by the world standards, easily number two. Number two easily. But even by the world standards, I would dispute that. By the world standards, most people so say... Searches for happiness. Yeah. And happiness yeah. is not found yeah. in money and holidays and in good jobs. Really everyone tended does. People, yeah. but that's the lie of our society. Yeah. So yeah. That's the con. If you, if push comes to shove and you gave, if you gave a man or a, a woman a choice between lots of money and a happy marriage, you know which I'll take any day? Not too sure. I'm, I'm pretty sure most people would get yeah. happiness. Happy, a good, happy life. marriage? Happiness would they want to come each night to a wife who, who bitches at them and nags at them? Or would the, uh, uh, would the vice versa? Yeah. Yeah. No. Oh, no. No way. Or kids that f go off the rails because they've neglected them? because they haven't had time for them.
kids that are angry with them? <laughs> okay. Right. No. Okay. It's it's definition of. There is a right kind of prosperity. There's 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 uh, 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 righteousness. There's God's goodness. God gives us all things to enjoy, and He gives us good gifts in the world to enjoy. Um, but the greatest prosperity has to do with uh, spiritual prosperity and pros pers if what you could personal prosperity, where you get on well with people, live in a good community, um, have lots of friends and a uh, good support system. We better go on. Um, now, theme H. Uh, I would have expected now, one of the themes of Jeremiah is that God is going to fulfill his threat in, that comes in the book of Deuteronomy. Um, because the people have broken the covenant, uh, they go into exile. Okay? Now, um, if they go into exile, I would have expected God to raise up a second Moses to bring them back from exile. Right? Just as they were in Egypt. Okay? that he'd raise up a second Moses. Now look at what God's promise how, about how he will deliver his people from exile back to himself. Can we go to 23, 1 through to 8? And I think it's your turn, isn't it, Levi? Levi. Levi. <laughs> the jeans man. <laughs> 23, 1 to 8. Woe to the shepherds who are destroying and scattering the sheep of my pasture, declares the Lord. Therefore, this is what the Lord, the God of Israel, says to the shepherds who tend my people. Just put pause there. The shepherds here is referring to leaders and particularly yeah. kings. So the shepherds of the nation, the picture is the nation is the flock, and the shepherds are the leaders. The chief shepherd is the king. So it's not as much like priests. It's more it's kings, and priests. kings and priests too, but basically no, but but no, but the focus is on political leaders. Okay. Okay. They are the shepherds of the nation. Keep going. Because you have scattered my flock and driven them away, and have not bestowed care on them. I will bestow punishment on you for the evil you have done. The the Lord. I myself will gather the remnant of my flock out of the country, out of all the countries where I have driven them and will bring them back to their pasture, for they will be fruitful and increase in number. I will place shepherds over them who attend them, and they will no longer be afraid or terrified, nor will any be missing, declares the Lord. Pause there. God says to the shepherds, since you have uh, exploited the sheep and scattered the sheep instead of gathering the sheep, I will bring judgment on you. Um, I will attend to you, see to you, and I myself then will shepherd my people. So God becomes the shepherd of his people. And he says that he will stab, put shepherds over them. Now you need to know that the word pastor is also the word, in, is the Latin word for shepherd. Sorry, I this was going. Keep going. The days are coming, declares the Lord, when I'll raise up to David a righteous branch, a king who will reign wisely do what is just and right in the land. In his days, Jew will be saved, and Israel will live in safety. Just stop there. So God promises that in the future he will raise up a new king, a new David, who will shepherd his people. The kings have failed to shepherd the people, so he will raise up a new David to shepherd his people in righteousness. Um, and they will live safety. Now, look at what's funny about the name that God gives to this king. This is the name by which he will be called, the Lord, our righteousness. Just stop there. What's funny about that name? He's called the Lord. Yeah, he's called the Lord. The king is called the Lord. Now, the word in Hebrew <laughs> is Yahweh. So that is our, Yahweh that's Lord. Yahweh there. Yahweh, our righteousness. Uh, Yahweh, it's one word, Yahweh our righteousness. Um, so the king is called Yahweh, the king is called Lord, and um, he is the one who is righteous, and he is the one who justifies his people, who puts them right with God, gathers them together. Yeah, everyone else who has the name, the God in their name, is always the Elohim one, and this is, this is 
No, not all of them, but quite often they have to do. They uh, they don't are not for on the Lord, but what the Lord has done. So the Lord has heard my prayer or something. So it's a confession of faith. Um, but here it is. Uh, the full name Yahweh, and very often what's used then is like Jeremiah. You get Elijah, Isaiah. Yah is an abbreviation of Yahweh. Um, so uh, they are usually confessions of faith. So Elijah is Eli, is my God. Yah is Yahweh. So it's a confession of faith. Yahweh is my God. Um, that's Elijah, yeah. or Isaiah, means God saves, uh, and so on. But here, this is a different name because you get the full name, Yahweh, um, which is given to a king. Yes? And it's God talking about, the, about him. Yes, it's the name that God gives so, to this king. Yes, he's talking about him. Yeah, yeah right. Oh, this is the name that God gives. It's not human beings giving to a king, but it's the name that God gives to the king. His throne name. Keep going. So then, the days are coming, declares the Lord, when people will no longer say, As surely as the Lord lives, who brought the Israelites out of Egypt, but they will say, As surely as the Lord lives, who brought the descendants of Israel up out of the land of the north and out of all the countries where he had banished them. Then they will live in their own land. So they'll have a new confession of faith. The old confession of faith was Yahweh brought us out of the land of Egypt with Moses. But the new confession of faith will have to do with what this king does to bring them out of their exile. So a new confession of faith. And that new confession of faith focuses on this king who is Yahweh our righteousness. Um, as you know, Paul makes a great deal of this uh, and says Jesus is the righteousness of God, the holiness of God, the redemption of God. Uh, and he's thinking in that first part, Yahweh is our righteousness of this passage. Is Israel the northern kingdom? I can get it used for, for either the northern kingdom or um, both northern and southern kingdom, but at this stage the northern kingdom is not existing anymore. Yeah, that's... Uh, that's the rest of, I, I just thought that was the restoration of the northern kingdom. No, it has to do with the southern kingdom, if the context here. But that includes people from the north. Mm -hmm. right? Uh? But the focus here is on the southern kingdom. Uh, it's a long time ago that they were taken into exile. Yeah. Now, what's the most important of the promises of Jeremiah is Jeremiah's promise of a new covenant. Dylan, you have the privilege of reading this and take note of it. It's um, quoted frequently in the New Testament. Uh, so uh, Jeremiah chapter 31, verses 31 to 34. I'll tell you to pause at points rather than comment about it at the end. Yes, just start reading. The time is coming, declares the Lord, when I will make a new covenant with the house of Israel and with the house of Judah. It will not be like the covenant I made with their forefathers when I took them by the hand to lead them out of Egypt, because they broke my covenant, though I was a husband to them, declares the Lord. Just stop there. The old covenant was God's covenant with Israel at Mount Sinai. He promised to be their God, and he made them his people, and he gave them the Ten Commandments. So it's a, it's a covenant which has to do with law, Ten Commandments. Um, Okay, the covenant in which he made them his holy people. Now, what's the difference between that old covenant and the new covenant that God promises? Keep going. This is the covenant I will make with the house of Israel after that time, declares the Lord. I will put my law in their hands and write it on their hearts. I will be their God and they will be my people. Just stop there. Now, the word here for law is the Hebrew word Torah. Have you had it already in Hebrew? What does Torah mean? Teaching. teaching, literally. And then a more narrow sense is a particular kind of teaching, which is the teaching of law. So Torah is God's teaching. 
So it is the act of teaching. God as teacher, teaching his people. And Torah always is practical teaching. Um, so let's say, for example, I could write a book about the theory of cricket. That's not Torah. But if I Torah you cricket, what would I be doing? Rules and regulations. No. no oh, teaching. Teaching. I would be yeah. coaching. 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 It's practical teaching. It's apprentice stuff. It's not just uh, um, teaching you the theory of it, but showing you, modeling to you, and helping you to do it. Right? So Torah is practical teaching, always, primarily. Um, and Torah, so it's teaching, but it's also what God teaches, which is his word. So it's that double word. It's God's teaching and what he teaches, which is his word, and his word is both law and gospel. Now, what's the first difference between um, God's teaching in the Old Covenant and God's teaching in the New Covenant, Dylan? The law and gospel bit. <laughs> no, just take this literally. Uh, no, no, no. Yes, okay. Like that. Yes. What, what does he say there? I will put my Torah where? Uh, in their minds and in their hearts. In their minds and in their hearts. So the teaching won't be out there, but it will be in, internalized. Personal rather than... Well, the other could be personalized, but it's internal. So it'll be not just a matter of somebody telling what... But knowing what's what because of your, from your conscience. So it's teaching in the conscience. Just wait, oh, we're going to go through. Keep going. Keep going? Yep. Was a, uh, no, longer, no longer will a man teach his neighbour or a man his brother say, Know the Lord, because they will all know me from the least of them to the greatest, declares the Lord. For I will forgive them, forgive their wickedness, and will remember their sins no more. Now the old covenant was written... The Ten Commandments were written on stone. But God's law, God's teaching now is written in people's hearts. And the teaching, the Torah um, at Mount Sinai had to do with worship and living a life that was consistent with worship. Now the Torah that God writes in people's hearts has to do with right worship of Him. Um, and as a result of it, everybody will know the Lord. They won't be, have to be taught about the Lord, but they will know Him. Not just know about Him, but know Him personally. So they will have direct access to God. Not indirect access to God. You remember that uh, the closest the Israelites could get to God was to the altar. They could never get to the Holy of Holies, let alone to get to God in heaven. In the New Covenant, Everybody will have equal access to God. Everybody will be able to know God. And why will this be? What's the foundation for the new covenant, Dylan? No idea. Read the last a part of it. Sorry. The last part of verse 34. For I will forgive their wickedness and will remember their sins no more. Right. The old covenant was based on law, in a sense. Torah in the sense of law. The Ten Commandments. What's the New Covenant based on? Well, forgiveness of grace. On grace, forgiveness of sins. Remember Jesus' words at the Last Supper? This is the cup of the New Covenant. Where does Jesus get that from? Here. And the New Covenant, so this is the blood or the cup of the New Covenant shed for you for the forgiveness of sins. Um, that's what you have here. Forgiveness is release from sin. Um, and the result of it is that God won't remember people's sins. He'll forgive their sins and won't hold them against them. So you have here a promise of a new covenant uh, based on God's, uh, uh, forgiveness rather than observance of the law. A new covenant in which all people will have equal access to God and know God. A new covenant which will be written, not on tablets of stone, but will be written in people's hearts. Now, the next prophet we're going to look at is going to pick up that theme and we'll talk about the way 
God writes his law in people's hearts and he's going to refer to the work of the Holy Spirit. So who's going to be the teacher? The Holy Spirit. Now, Jeremiah doesn't go that far here. He talks about the fact that God's going to write his law. Jeremiah goes that one step further. Any questions on this? Yeah. So when he says he's going to write his law in our hearts and minds, that's not our conscience. conscience. Well, it's because it's, it affects our conscience. It's not. It's not the conscience in yourself because your conscience, your, you see, your conscience is a bit like a compass. Yeah. Okay? Um, in itself, uh, uh, it's, it's, it, it, it's, it, it needs to have a magnetic pole to determine direction. So it needs to have a standard outside of itself. Some people can have a, a dodgy compass. Then. You can have a dodgy compass because you are, it's fixed on the wrong magnetic yeah. point. Okay. So, um, so you, can, you can get, just if I can illustrate, um, people's conscience are usually formed by what mum or dad says is true or false or right or wrong. That's kids first of all. Yeah. Don't? Now if, if uh, uh, that's okay if mum and dad teach what's right and wrong objectively but it, it can be twisted. Mm -hmm. Then you get the next stage is instead of your, your conscience being governed by what mum or dad says it's what your mates say. Your mates say and then you get a bit more sophisticated. It's what society says. You internalize political correctness. And if you go further than that, you form your own uh, uh, standards. But your own standards may not be in accord with God's standards. So here you get a conscience that's guided by the Word of God as law and gospel. So God's Torah as law and gospel is written in people's hearts um, so that their conscience will be able to work accurately and reveal spiritual realities. I don't know whether you realize but one of the big problems we have in our society and in our church and all churches is that we don't have a teaching of the Ten Commandments God's law and this means that even though people have consciences and have a bad conscience, their conscience doesn't work accurately. They feel guilty about the wrong things and they excuse themselves for the wrong things. And, and they uh, feel quite good conscience about things that they shouldn't have a good conscience. They have neurotic guilt or misplaced guilt. So you get a funny phenomena. Say for example, you get a bloke who commits adultery, doesn't bother him, but he feels guilty about being wealthy or uh, abusing the environment. Now which is the, what should he be feeling guilty about? The adultery is so breaking God. Guilt, yeah. It's transferred guilt, it's neurotic guilt, it's misplaced guilt. Well, what you said from this, if you feel bad about something, it's conscience, and that still is a bit of sin. Because you said that they're in his hearts and minds, and we're up conscience. No, well, what God's going to do is to plant his word as law and gospel yeah. in people's hearts and minds so that instead of feeling guilty about the wrong things, they will feel guilty about the right things, right? and so and, and they will be justified, they will have the right kind of good conscience. No, have I switched things around? Have I muddled you? No, I don't. Okay. Yep. Luther says it terrorizes the heart to bring them back to yeah. God. Yes, because it diagnoses the state of the heart and the spiritual realities uh, now, all of us have misplaced guilt. We feel uh, uh, guilty about the wrong things. Uh, you know, and it gets funny kind of phenomena in our society. People have cleanliness manias or all sorts of other neurotic um, symptoms. They feel bad about being dirty. Physically. Uh, physically. Yeah, you, yeah. you spoke that last year, and I had the opportunity when I was out 
proponent of speaking that to another bloke because he said his, what, his partner's continuing to clean it. Yes, 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 yes. And I said, well, our lecturer would say something different. Yes. And he asked me what, and I told yes. him, it's yes. in, inside, it's in that hard stuff yes. that needs, needs to clean. Yes, that, that's a symptom that some, there's a misplaced guilt here um, and that uh, there's an uneasy con uh, conscience about something that probably that woman, she's not even aware of. Yeah. It's hidden. Yeah. And Satan works by confusing everything. He confuses law and gospel. Um, he makes us, uh, he excuses us where, uh, of things that we should feel guilty about and he makes us feel guilty about things that we don't have to feel guilty about. No, that's always his way. He twists everything back to front. I'm Last sure. thing. And, yeah, yeah I've uh, said it too much. And you said it right at the beginning, God, how God calls people silently and then to a... Through, through others, through a, through a spokesman. Yes, yes, and that's how God calls yes. people to come... Back to him. Back to him, and also it, it's the way he shapes their conscience, yeah. shapes their souls, their, forms their conscience. See, what God's doing, what you haven't been realising, maybe, is that God's basic work with you, if you look back on it, is sensitising, shaping, forming your conscience. That's the most decisive thing that's been happening in your life, and it's a lifelong business, so that your conscience works properly. Um, and, and you need both law and gospel for your conscience to work properly uh, and the whole of your life is uh, uh, th that happening and being shaped that's going to be much more important for your formation as past, uh, you know, in pre preparation for the ministry than anything you learn in class that shaping formation of conscience and to put it the other way around, your basic task as teachers or as preachers is going to be to deliver people a good conscience. A good conscience is what God wants to give to people. Not a bad conscience. Much of the preaching in the church at this moment in time is delivers people a bad conscience or just blunts the conscience, desensitizes the conscience. What? Is a word for like um, just pretty much ignoring law. Antinomianism uh, is one of the, okay. the tax, but then you get legalism as the other problem. So you get antinomianism, um, which is a rejection of God's law. The other extreme is legalism. Both of them are equally wrong. Or you get what's called gospel reductionism. What's gospel reductionism? Gospel. To excuse <laughs> sin. Right? A gospel reductionism is using the gospel not to justify sinners, but to justify sin. 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 Mm. I'm a Christian. That means I can sin. I'm free. I can do what... Right? So gospel reductionism. But there's lots of other symptoms too. Yes. I'm wondering if... Sorry, um, yes. I'd better let you get back on track. I'll ask you in the break. Yeah. No, quickly. Okay, uh, I'm wondering how repentance fits into uh, God's way for salvation for Christians if it's just faith, grace. Um, our whole life is a life of repentance as Christians. Repentance is not just something that happens one point in your life. Mm. <clears throat> your whole life is a journey back to God your whole life is God putting to death the old David, the egocentric, self-centered David, and creating a new David in Christ. Um, and what happens every day is uh, God, through his law, exposes your sin. Not just the sins you do, but things, sins which have to do with what you think and what, how you feel, what you desire and what you are, in order to lead you to repentance um, and to lead you to seek forgiveness. Um, have a look at Luther's small catechism, where he says, what does such baptizing with water signify? 
It signifies that the old Adam us in, in us should by daily contrition and repentance be drowned and die, and daily a new man, a new person, come forth and arise who shall live before God in righteousness and purity forever. Remember that Paul says that baptism is that we are put to death with Christ in order to be raised with Christ. Right, oh, then, but this is a daily bap outworking of baptism. We are daily put to death. Sorry? Dying to live, that's saying, Baal. The, the, no. I mean, when Paul says we must die daily to sin, what book is that again? Uh, Romans 6 is the, uh, that's in connection with baptism. So if, so if someone was excusing so. sin because they've got the gospel and they're saying other Christians, they would pull out say, yes. John, uh, Second John or something? Uh, yes. Yeah, okay. Um, or First John says, you know, yeah, that First John, yeah. John says, yeah. look, it's impossible. Um, if, uh, uh, no. So anybody who's born again can't sin, shouldn't sin. Uh, you can't excuse sin. All sin is lawless. All law is sin is lawlessness. And uh, you can't excuse sin. But in the same hand, if anyone sins, we have an advocate uh, before the Father, Jesus Christ the righteous. So always, unless you have, and can I, this is the last thing I want to say about formation of conscience, unless you correctly divide law and gospel and use law and gospel you will never be able to give people a good conscience the only thing that delivers a good conscience is the right use of both law and gospel uh, in our Christian life um, let's have a look at the last passage and then the um, uh, final uh, summing up of Jeremiah okay uh, Josh can you read Jeremiah 3, 15 to 18? Remember that Jeremiah prophesies the destruction of the temple and destruction of the city of Jerusalem. Please. I will give you shepherds after my own heart who will feed you with knowledge and understanding. And when you have multiplied and increased in the land, in those days, says the Lord, they shall no longer say, the ark of the covenant of the Lord, shall not come to mind or be remembered or missed, nor shall another one be made. At that time Jerusalem shall be called the throne of the Lord, and all nations shall gather to it, to the presence of the Lord in Jerusalem, and they shall no longer stubbornly follow their own evil will. Um, Jeremiah here prophesies a time in the future when there will no longer be any Ark of the Covenant. Remember the Ark of the Covenant was the place that the container that had God's law in it. And it was the throne of God located in the Holy of Holies, the temple. Um, why will there no longer be any Ark of the Covenant? Well, the whole city of Jerusalem will be the new temple. And there'll be no Ark of the Covenant because the whole throne, the whole city will be the throne of God, the place where God's enthroned, the place where God rules. And he rules then, if you take the other prophecy, in the hearts and minds of people. Um, that's the promise. Here, and when this happens, then nations will come to worship, Gentile nations will come to worship God in New Jerusalem, uh, together with the Jews. So that's not the physical location. Sorry? That's not the physical location. Um, at this point, we don't know, but if you follow the prophecy of Jerem uh, Isaiah, remember, he said that uh, the prophecies of Isaiah said that uh, the, God's promises about earthly Zion will be fulfilled in Children. heavenly Zion, in the new heavens, new earth. Yeah. And for us, Zion, these promises which have to do with Zion, Jerusalem, have to do with the church. It's in the church that God will give new shepherds, pastors, to pastor his people. He will gather the people from exile. He will be enthroned and rule in the church. And in the church, then, both people who are Jews and Gentiles will worship in one community. So it's a prophecy about the church. Okay, the purpose of the book of Jeremiah. Okay, the book of Jeremiah was compiled after his death 
by uh, scribes such as Baruch and Zariah. They are two disciples of Jeremiah, scribes, educated men, who um, compiled the prophecies of Jeremiah in a book. Um, and this group of scribes were also uh, the same group of scribes that was responsible for the great prophetic history uh, from Joshua through to Second Kings. Compiling. In compiling it. Compiling. Yeah. Right? They didn't write it. They wrote some parts of it, but linking stuff. Yeah. What they did was to gather material and edit it. Yeah. So um, these people edited the prophecies of Jeremiah and they edited for people in what situation? It was people in exile. And it had two purposes for people in exile. Number one, it showed people who were under God's judgment why God had rejected his people and allowed them to be taken into exile. Number one. And then secondly, to call God's people to repentance and to encourage them to hope in God for the restoration of the city of Jerusalem. So 70 years they had to wait for the restoration. But there's a promise of restoration, so you get both law and gospel. The most important thing is that the final version of Jeremiah is not spoken to people before the exile, but to spoken to people in exile. Lastly, um, the book of Jeremiah calls the church at all times and all places to repentance and to hope in God for forgiveness. So repentance, law, forgiveness, gospel. So it's a great book of law and gospel. Let's have a break. <laughs>